Hey folks, with us today, Matt Doyle, founder of buildarray.com. Matt, super happy to have you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Cool. Let's dive right in and start with what problem uh, does your product actually solve for its customers? Yeah. So we always have a little joke to start people off, which is like, we're like Google Forms on steroids. So, you know, there's a lot of form tools out there, um, type form and Google Forms, but we never called ourselves um, coolforms.com because we never sort of saw ourselves as a form tool. Um, you know, we saw ourselves as a bit more than that, but we're for operations and risk and compliance. So field-based teams who would have typically used paper and pen uh, or an Excel spreadsheet for data collection. That's the problem we solve. Interesting. And then you're basically like a lot of form tools like Tally, Typeform, they all have this strong PLG motion. So like super bottoms up, like 10 bucks a seat and so on. And you go quite the opposite route, like coming in from like doing enterprise sales in a way. And I know that you're like kind of like a product guy, like in terms of your background. So why did you decide to go after like the, let's quote unquote, the form space but with an enterprise motion instead of the typical bottoms up, like most of us product peeps basically start out with? We didn't really. Like we are focused on the enterprise market, but we try to bring a product-led growth approach to an enterprise market. Interesting. So actually, if you look at the website, um, the pro plan, which is what most people will go for, is 40 bucks a month per user, which isn't enterprise pricing at all. Uh, and what we, we found is that operations teams who are our customers, they do have some buying power. They have a company credit card and they're kind of fed up with trying to go through IT or IT trying to build stuff. So they have a bit of buying power to pay with a credit card and onboard themselves so that the product has to be you know, easy to use uh, that they can self-serve, but then they grow. So we have a um, a saying when we're talking to a lot of these people, which is think big, but start small. We actually want them to start in a small way and nail that first problem. And then they grow. Like the growth that we have through companies is massive, that product led growth. So instead of like, yeah, I think product led growth normally means like somebody uses it. And because you filled in their form, you saw that they were using that form and you then signed up. Ours is slightly different where because it, it's very much an internal tool. Like we're not, no, we can work in the web, but we tend to be used by people that work for you. Um, but what happens is they'll do one use case and then they'll do another use case and another and another and another and another, and it scales up. And then it becomes an enterprise priced product after that. So it's more of a, it's more of a land and expand motion in a way with like two people in like an operations team starting to work with you. And then it like spreads like white fire in there. And then do you, actually do like some things or like what's your trigger to go and do the outreach because I had a call with a with a PLG driven founder last week and they now that their market turns a bit sour I mean recording this like June 23 they start to heavily try to turn on sales but like it's kind of hard if you're like a PLG company and you never did sales before so do so I think a two-part question first off do you actually do active sales like we, we typically think of when we uh, say enterprise sales. And secondly, if you do so, what's the trigger for you that, you know, ah, that's a client where now I need to trigger that sales motion? Mm. Okay. I'll try and answer that as concisely as possible. Um, some companies aren't, I think, okay, so it's not, not just speaking of myself, but my, my opinion generally in product. Like I think some products you could never do direct sales with effectively meaning you could do it but it would be not cost effective like if you try to sell a type form product in an enterprise capacity like the cost that it the salesperson and the lead generation it will was it really financially worth it maybe not um so that's one part i'd say so shifting can be hard for that reason because it's just not financially viable you haven't built a business that has an enterprise grade offering at the other, other end of the rainbow. Uh, so that could be a problem that person might have been seeing. Um, we, the way we deal with it is, um, like I said, we try to, the hypothesis we were proving to ourselves and to our investors was like, can we find people in an organic way? So SEO uh, and um, things like that, right? And then 
bring them in and get them paying for something. You know, that's the rules of like the minimum viable product and, and the lean methodology, which is like get them paying for something, just get them in and then you can you can expand. So we try and get them in and just using it and solving that one problem for like 40 bucks a month, nothing, right? But then we will like, um, we have automated messages and stuff like that, but we will reach out and say, hey, can we help? Can we do something else for you? Build forms for you or something like that. And so what we have is that when someone comes in, we lead score them. So we're tracking someone from the minute they come in the door and wh- how much um, they've used the product, how much they've engaged with it, and we're lead scoring them. And if they, we look into them and say, we look into everybody that comes in the door and we'll try and call every single person just, just to help them, not to try and sell them necessarily or upsell them. It's just to make sure they have an active, successful trial of some kind because um, that's the best chance of them going on to convert. But if they're a bigger opportunity, my colleague will bring myself in and I'll then be more of a consultative sale. Uh, and that's the bigger deals that we work with. And often they're an enterprise deal because they need a little bit more TLC or they're going to need a few more questions answered. But we find that if they've had a little play with the product on their own back, um, then they're much more receptible to like having a chat and talking and being consultative. Um, and it came to a point that the day there was a guy that we, we are closing out now and we said, look, you know, the way we see, the way I see it is you've got, you could, you've got two options. You can go for that other option you're looking at and it's going to cost you X amount. And it's going to, you know, but you're going to get what you want or you can go with us and we're going to be a bit more collaborative. We're going to be able to do this for you and do that. And you're going to have more flexibility and it's going to cost less, but they're, that you need, you need to decide not me, you know, and then they went with us, you know, so being consultative in our approach rather than just being hardcore sales. That's the difference between an enterprise sale and just like a, a normal sale, I think. So do you see it kind of a mix of enter, like kind of sales and customer success then? Because what you, like the thing you're telling, like talking to them after they signed up, making sure they're successful. That's like, that's which some people would put under the clear CS department, basically. So do, do you even make an effort to differentiate or is it like the one of the same thing for you internally? Um, what do you mean one and the same thing? One, one of the same thing, meaning do you make a difference between customer success and sales or do you just say, hey, it's one of the same. We're trying to make people successful and because we're selling consultatively, basically, it's like the same people maybe even internally we don't it's all custom success none of it's sales in my opinion because we actually have a very very low churn rate uh because actually we in the early days we were selling to lots of small businesses right and like they were um using it loving it but then we'll just stop using it it's because the problem wasn't really big enough for them right so we found with bigger companies data collection normalization of data security of it is a real big problem if it's not solved that's a big problem. So they don't, once they're on be- embedded and onboarded correctly, they just don't leave. Um, so uh, we, we find that the, the bigger companies just sort of stick around and they, and they stay with us. So, it, but we have to be consultative and make sure it's the right sale. Um, and I know what I was going to say was that I was speaking to some of the, the people at Typeform, someone within it, and they said that they had a term called the happy churner, which means that like, they've been super happy with the product. They didn't do anything wrong. They love the product. They used it for what they needed it for. And then it just, they just churned because that was it. They, they've come to the end. We don't have customers like that. We do occasionally, but not on the same scale as someone like that because our product is an everyday tool. It's, you know, it's used every single day, day in and day out because it's operational paperwork. It's not an online form that gets used occasionally. So we'll get people who come in who are probably that happy churner and that's fine. And we let them self-serve and onboard and we're here to help them. But we're more interested in people who need operational stuff that stays in place and doesn't just churn out. It's more like an ERP or a CRM. Once you bought it, it's you keep it for the next four or five years and beyond as long as you keep innovating for them. This episode is brought to you by ReactSquad.io, the boutique React agency for SaaS startups. If your front-end team is overwhelmed and you need more hands on deck, go to ReactSquad.io and get a ReactJS developer embedded in your team in less than seven days. And how many people do you have in your team that actually work on that meeting, making the customer successful, aka in a way selling? Pretty much everybody. Uh, actually like so but has a, a some kind of impact into making sure the customer is successful uh, but obviously not every customer f- feels one of those members of staff working on what they're doing 
But um, there's, so there's probably three people uh, on a regular basis. There's myself dealing with more so the larger scale enterprise deals, which is things over a thousand dollars a month, two thousand dollars a month usually. And then uh, my colleague Dave, he deals with every single person coming in the door and is like validating them and helping them out. And then we've got a success manager who helps with implementation and onboarding. Actually, probably four as well. We've got another customer success person who's dealing with like support and questions, but also building stuff for people, building forms for people um, uh, or use cases so they can see it. Yeah, so that's four people. What's like the rest of the team in terms of setup or distribution? Development, uh, development people. How many people are you then overall on the team? Five people. Interesting. So you basically have like four, four or five people like really helping out with this customer success motion in a way. Yeah. And so like the, the, even the tech team are potentially doing integrations for people or um, helping people calibrate things or connect it to their systems. So that's why I'm saying pretty much everybody is involved in making sure the customers are successful and we're consultative with them. Um, interesting. Yeah. And then another thing I found super interesting is that I guess you're like closing on to like the million ARR mark or like We don't need like to go into detail there, but then uh, I heard another interview that in 2020 you raised like a 1.3 million seed a pre-seed round, and you bootstrapped for a while before that. And I mean, you started like 2015. So why did you make the decision to raise VC so late? Did you first thought you would go the bootstrap route, or was it like a thing you want just want to make sure that everything is set up so you have like less dilution? Um, well, I've been, I'm 37 now and I've been self-employed building digital products full time since I was 23, but I was building websites and other things and working as a freelance designer before that. And so we knew how to go about building something like, yeah, there was a lot to learn, but we knew how to go about to go build something. Initially, the idea as well was in the marketing space. So I don't know if I talked about that in the last interview, but originally array was called launch cloud and it was for marketing companies for collecting data in the field so we worked with nintendo coca-cola heineken and we had all these big brands and they were the, the the problem we found with that industry is it's very seasonal and so they could love it use it pay loads of money and then the campaign's over so we're like that's where we start to pivot into into risk and operation things like that so Anyways, for a bit of the time, it was like we were just building it and chipping away at it because we knew how to go about it. Um, secondary, like I tried to raise money, and and you being you're in Europe, and the, I find the UK was very very hard to raise early stage capital. Like when you don't have, you know, I, I was talking. I remember I talked to an investor, and they said, "Okay, cool, where well, we love it. Uh, let us know when you're making a million a year, and we'll do 500k." I was like, "What?" <laughs> you know. So uh, I was like. Anyway, I'm sure there is people out there. Obviously, there is people there raising money and doing fantastic. But I, I couldn't get the deal. I couldn't get a deal done uh, with early stage capital. We were involved in some incubators and stuff um, in Europe. You probably had. I don't know if you heard of Wira. We're in, uh, in Europe. I don't. Uh, I don't think I've heard of them yet. Yeah, it's a core. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I do yeah. know. I do know. So we're yeah. a portfolio company of that, and so we did things like that and got money that way. Um, <clears throat> but. Uh, it was very hard to raise capital. So I had to kind of make a case to immigration to move to America and then move to America, then get my family settled. So it was kind of all that kind of stuff. So when we raised the capital, we did it in the US uh, with US investors. And then uh, last year, we the markets were crazy and not in a good spot. And I don't think investors really knew what they wanted. I mean, they were just doing completely no-brainer deals. Uh, they were just, you know, they could just get in on. Um, so we just worked on getting to break even and that's why we didn't grow the team because like, we were growing organically with SEO, uh, and we, uh, and people upgrading and we knew those upgrades, they'd been baking for a while. So we we're about to hit and they all hit in the first quarter of this year. Um, and that, all that momentum we've been working on. So we just kind of like stayed put and just grew organically. Um, and now we're leveraging things like found a path and cap chase to continue to teach, continue growth and have dry powder. and we are talking to some investors now, but we're in a position of like strength where we're like, yeah, maybe we'll take it. Maybe we won't. I mean, we want to grow, but it shouldn't be growth at all costs. And we never, I never believed that anyway. That's why we bootstrapped for so long. It's like, because we wanted to, like you say, hold on to equity. And we felt like we had some work we could do ourselves. Um, so yeah, that's a brief history of that. That's super intriguing. How do you find the balance between not growing at all costs 
But still, I mean, you took venture capital, meaning the goal needs to be 100 million ARR, basically. So how do you find that balance, both both strategically as well as emotionally in the day to day? So you mean like, uh, ha, ha. can you phrase that a different way so I can make sure yeah. I can answer, what, answer what, how what, you want? What I, what I mean is you, you just said that you're not trying to grow at all cost, but usually taking VC pushes you towards doing that because you need to get to that massive outcome because you took on investor money and there are specific expectations on returning quite, quite a lot of money to them back. So how do you manage those like pulling forces of like trying not to grow at all costs, especially in the market situation, but still trying to, in a way, fulfill the obligation towards investors that you took on? Mm. Yeah, um, I think their investors' perception has changed in the last 12 to 18 months uh, of companies who can be more fiscally responsibility, uh, responsible uh, for how they spend money and how they grow. Um, the, the particular investors that we have, uh, specifically one of them, famously grew a multi-million dollar company from just 500k of investment. So he's very much like, hey, you know, just only take what you need and stuff like that. And we all want to grow a massive company. We don't want to be like kind of being overly conservative and not pushing hard enough. But, you know, companies like us now who are approaching a million dollars in ARR, uh, break even if prof if not profitable, is a very attractive place to be in. And um, not a lot of companies can uh, who have taken VC have, have be able to posture themselves into a position like that because they've just taken on too much liability with staff and offices and things like that. So that's why we're doing it at this in this season. Now, there's a season for everything. You know, when we took the investment money, we were spending more than we were making. And then we leveled that out. So um you just gotta know what season you're in and when's time to push and when's time to 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 take stock and grow sustainably. So we've started to push harder now, like because now we've got a better, ourselves in a better position and people like those um uh debt financing people love the position we're in and and we just when we're still being careful not to get over our skis but we're making sure we invest our money in growth not all costs sustainable growth and we know what's going on and for a while we were making sure we had all the metrics so we could track mrr arr customer lifetime value churn and know what was going on because you know a lot of, you know people would just throw money at something to try and make it grow but it's nice to know why it's growing or how you're going to sort of sustain that growth going forward. And I think we're in a good position to do that. And that's why we've gone back out to investors and we're talking to them and they're taking a, a good look at us. Definitely. I would love to double click on what you mentioned, the leveraging debt. So meaning like founder path, which is, if I'm correct, like non-dilutive. So basically short term or like mid midterm in terms of like, like the, the debt you take on. How did you make the decision to do that? Because I think like taking on debt is, can be, like an amazing thing to grow, but also like I personally like we bootstrap early notes so far, and that in a way pushes like up like a, a weird feeling of like angst or in a way. So like, how do you? So first of all, how did you make the decision to to take on that? And secondly, what would maybe be a tip for someone who's in the position that he's like playing with the thought of taking it or not, like to to come to a good conclusion if you should do it or if you shouldn't. We, we've done it with a few people in the past, uh, including Stripe as well. So not all of our money goes through Stripe. So Stripe don't know about all of our financial position and, they, and they're constantly offering money uh, to us. And we have done that before. Um, and we've worked with CapChase and we've worked with um, Founder Path and we work with Pipe. We're kind of like probably rare where we've worked with a few different ones. Um, I mean, they try and make it as transparent as possible and they do have a very strict... Um, underwriting process to see that you are in the right place for them. Um, but you have to have a very specific reason for taking the money, I think, right? So for us, it was to start working on pay-per-click because we'd never done paid outbound before, but it should work because competitors in our space spend a lot of money in that. It's just, I guess the question needs to be, do we have deep enough pockets to, to compete with it or not? but we have to try something. And then knowing what, I mean, a lot of these people as well, they make you pay it down in 12 months. So it's not like a credit card, which can just keep rolling over and you're just paying interest. You've got 12 months. So you know, as soon as that first payment is due to them, 
is four, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars, whatever it might be, for how much that you've taken from them. And so you know that that's really being taken away from you each month. And then hopefully the incentive that you've done pays for itself. So if you took X amount of money and the pay down is five thousand dollars a month, and you can then create a new a new five thousand in MRR, then it was worth it, wasn't it? I, you know, absolutely, now you're there. absolutely. And then I would love to stay on like the growth, um, yeah, topic in a way, which is like you mentioned SEO and that you're now working on paid ads. Were are those like the main two that like? pushed your growth or like what's your like growth stack in a way in terms of like what channels are you working on our our growth has came all from um networking me networking and organic seo that's it but a, a successful b2b company needs a blend and a mix and some will do better than others and also you might do something for a while like a certain type of PP, ppc channel And eventually it just plateaus out and that's just the name of the game. So that's where all of our growth has come from. We're just implementing PPC, but we're doing, trying to be as sophisticated with it as possible, meaning we've got very specific landing pages for those people to get to our website. We're not just dumping them on our homepage. It's specific keywords, specific uses, specific web pages with ready-made forms, ready-made PDFs speaking to that audience. So when they go there, they should hopefully be highly targeted for that. Um, we're just starting an outbound strategy, which is like an email outbound with a with a partner. Uh, this partner potentially could be an investor as well. Uh, so we're just spinning that up. And we've been dubious about that type of stuff in the past. But we, I've also, I just talked to a lot of people and try and figure things out. There was an ex Google employee who did a lot of this that I've consulted with a lot as well on the right approach to do that kind of outbound strategy. We probably, we've looked into companies that would do phone calls and stuff for you. And we will probably move into that at some point, but the the risk to re potential reward was high because it's like, I think they, my research, typically a company that's doing those calls is about five to six, seven thousand dollars a month. And then they're going to make you stick with them for at least a year usually. So, okay, that might work, but like the, the debt example, <clears throat> you need to, in a sort of certain time period of time, you need to be making that, you know, investment back pretty soon. So there's a higher risk with that. Um, so yeah, PPC is just spinning up really and outbound is just spinning up. Um, so we're just trying to execute that in the best way possible. Yeah. When you start those new, new channels, how, how do you drive it in terms of X and experiment? Because in the end you can't know if outbound will work. So do you give yourself like three months, a specific budget? So how do you think about like testing out channels in a way? Yeah. I mean, you have to try an MVP and, and try and do something in a minimal way without too much investment or back it up with research or, and I think it comes down to a bit of gut. You need to be honest with yourself. Like do, is your product proposition really crafted well enough to do outbound and have you postured yourself in the right way to transact with people in that way? Well, so if you pay a company to do outbound, they're only going to dump the leads on your lap and then it's up to you to then process them through. So do you really have the maturity in the company to be able to do that? And because we were doing with me, me and Dave for so long, um, dealing with all the organic people and calling them and putting a process there in place, we feel confident that we could do more um, of that outbound stuff and know that we weren't wasting anybody. We would call it like a leaky bucket. Like there's leaks yeah. in your pipeline where that potentially could have been someone good, but you didn't process them correctly. You didn't outreach to them correctly and stuff like that. So we make sure that, You need to feel in your gut that you do have that. There's no leaky pipes. Otherwise, you're going to def it's not going to be an accurate test. Um, and maybe you can, you know, hire somebody just from Upwork or something like that to just try out how that feels and how it the problems you might come across. Um, but PPC, you can't. That's why we chose to do PPC as an investment first over outbound calls because you could just okay, stuff things going wrong. It's not converting like we hope. Turn it off. You can just turn the tap off. You can't do that if you've signed a 12-month deal. Um, so things like that. There's, and there's, there's good ways to sort of test those things affordably before you go heavy. And if you're doing good metric tracking and you're seeing... So the way we look at it, and I talk about this in some of my social media videos, I just did one recently, and you look at it by, by bar charts. So the first one is awareness. So you could... Uh, next one is see, try, and then buy. 
And you need to make sure all of those things are seen to, because if one of those is not working correctly, you're going to get those leaky, leaky pipes. You can always pay for more traffic, but if the trial is bad, the experience is bad, and they're not either getting through the products or someone's not reaching out to them at the right time, then you're wasting all that money anyway. So we have to make you have to make sure all of those things are firmly in place before you start investing in those things, and that can all be done manually at first, and that's what we did. I love it. And then for the PPC, are you working with like an expert uh, outsider consultant or do you tr try that in-house? Because I, I feel like it's always a mix of what you want to, to keep in-house long-term or just like where you say, hey, okay, that's not our core expertise. That's outsources from day, from day one. H how do you manage that? Yeah, I think as a, speaking as a founder, it is our job to be a, a director, like in a movie, like we're not the talent, we're not the... Um, We're not the camera operator or the boom operator. Like we should helpfully find people to who are best at those things. But obviously in the early days, you have to do as many things as you can yourself. We're fortunate because, you know, where I came from is building e-commerce sites and, and Dave in my team, that's where he, he came from that and been doing PPC and SEO and building stuff. So that's why we also started there because we knew about that type of stuff and we, we do that all in house. Um, But you need sometimes help with content creation or things like that. Um, we would go outside. But yeah, we're lucky because we have that internally. Um, but I probably, if you didn't have that internally, you probably would want to hire that in. But you probably want to do a bit of research because obviously there's a lot of snake oil salesmen out there in that industry. So you need to sort of understand what you're getting into. And they can have some, you know, they're going to charge you a lot, some people. So you've got to find the right, pe right partner there. Absolutely. And then before we wrap up, what's the big vision for the company from your perspective? Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think I've ever said this in the video, but I'll try and articulate it. So, you know, um, I think, you know, with things like PDFs, they became a, a format that every computer could read, you know, a PDF done by Adobe and you can fill them in, but everyone hates them, you know. Uh, because they, I, feel, I get so frustrated when I try to fill one of those in. Often people put those on their websites and people are printing them out and filling them in. And they exist because current uh, web form technology can't really replace them because they're too complex or they have different sort of structures to them. I'd like us to, to be killing that PDF and killing the fillable PDF and, and, and ha being almost a new format for people to transact with rather than the fillable PDF. I think that's an amazing uh, moment to wrap this thing up. That was a, uh, quite a big mission, but I guess that's what you're after, right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. It was super fun to have you. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. If you like this episode, you will love our newsletter, The SAS Operator by Early Note. Get actionable insights from SAS veterans like Patrick Campbell, Christoph Jans, and Corey Haynes right into your inbox. Your five minute read every Tuesday for free. Go to elnot.com and subscribe for free.